Hello everyone, my name is Ryan Donahue. I'm from the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, New York. Um, I gave this talk or a similar talk in December at the National Digital Forum and back then I was at George Eastman House and this slides or these slides still mostly reflect the work I did there. Um, so a bit about me. Uh, you could find me at Ryan D on Twitter. I'm an information technologist by background. I've got a Bachelor's of Science in Information Technology from the Rochester Institute of Technology. And for the last five or six years, I was at George Eastman House working on collections management, digital asset management, the website, and digital preservation stuff. And now at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, I am a senior information systems developer in the Media Lab which is a new group in the museum's digital media department devoted to, to kind of uncovering new public-facing technology for the museum, which is about as good as it gets in terms of the intersection of technology and museums. This is the, the mighty George Eastman House. I was actually up in Rochester this weekend to move the last of my stuff out, um, so I got to, to at least drive by a couple times. Um, it's the home of George Eastman. Uh, Eastman, of course, founded the Eastman Kodak Company, where if you're, you know, above the or if you're above the age of 30 or so, you, you don't need any introduction to Kodak. But if you're younger than 30, uh, Kodak used to be a company that had some pretty major stakes in the photo game, um, but they uh, unfortunately didn't embrace digital like all of you I know will um, so you don't suffer the same terrible bankrupt fate uh, that Kodak did. Uh, let that be an early lesson to, to any Luddites in the room that uh, ignore digital preservation at your peril. George Eastman House has got many wonderful curatorial collections including the technology collection depicted top left with a Kodak Lunar Orbiter uh, rig that orbited the moon, took photographs, developed the film, scanned the film, and transmitted it wirelessly back to Earth, all in that weird metal boxy thing it's in. Um, George Eastman House also has historic gardens, a photo collection. Of course, that's uh, the world-famous National Geographic cover Afghan Girl, uh, photographed by Steve McCurry. Uh, the bottom right is a photograph from one of the many preserve restored rooms in the, the Eastman house, and the bottom left is a film still from Warner Brothers, The Wizard of Oz, for which the George Eastman house motion picture collection has one of the only surviving negatives. The photo collection will be the kind of focus of my talk today, and the photo collection covers the history of photography, uh, and it's truly international in scope. I mean, depicted here you've got uh, New Zealand, New York City, Egypt, Woolum, Wool Paula told me how to say this, but I forget. Woolamaloo, Woolamaloo, uh, Woolamaloo there, so that's near you guys. And then the bottom right is Germany somewhere. Uh, I'll go over this in kind of two parts. We'll first go over the history of digital at Eastman House, and then we'll, we'll get to my digital preservation secrets. In the early days of digital in the museum space, uh, the 1970s, uh, Eastman House began cataloging our collection records with the University of Rochester on computers not unlike the uh, craze featured in the Lewis Baltz photograph on this slide. Um, in the 1980s we realized how valuable that was and how computer-based cataloging wasn't going anywhere so we moved it in-house on a proprietary database built on microvaxes which uh, from a technology standpoint was absolutely the right move for the time but um, unfortunately the vax architecture didn't persist until uh, the present era so we had to eventually migrate um, to a more standard cataloging system um, we did that in the 2000s the early 2000s we migrated to TMS but not before the 90s happened and we digitized about a hundred thousand things to Laserdisc as many institutions did at the time. Uh, George Eastman House kind of prides itself on being the first cultural heritage institution to attempt to describe a photograph to a computer and of course they mean that in the, the kind of broadest 
uh, of terms and that describing not just image content, not just materiality, but kind of trying to describe everything there is to describe about a photograph to a computer. At Eastman House, digital preservation manifested in three major areas, digitized collections, uh, so digital surrogates for collection material. One of the important short-term early gains we made was considering digitized collection material to be collection material itself. It kind of enabled the institution to focus on uh, kind of allocating resources to things that the museum hadn't thought to before, like storage for collection material. So actually having a section of, of digital storage that was collection storage as well, which raised some really interesting philosophical discussions. The second major area, and this is a growing area, is born digital collection material. Eastman House doesn't have a lot, but it does have a few select pieces of born digital work in its collection. And the third category that gets kind of the least amount of attention is museum-generated interpretive content. So exhibition text or old publications or kind of any of a number of curatorial or educational outputs. Um, and I also always tried to uh, kind of make sure that digitization missteps where we made them became lessons learned that we didn't kind of repeat over and over again. Uh, while I wasn't at Eastman House for the Laserdisc era, I think it really did do a lot of good long term for the institution, enabling them to think strategically about digitization as opposed to just, yes, digitize everything which is the goal. Everyone wants to digitize everything, but uh, you kind of have to get there in a smart way. You can't just kind of throw caution to the wind, digitize a bunch of stuff, and hope it'll sort itself out. One of the interesting reasons why digitization and born digital material is so important is that production is moving steadily digital as well, starting with text and graphics with the original Macintosh and the original Laser Writer in the late 80s, to photography all throughout the 90s and early 2000s, uh, audio in the first half of the 90s, and motion picture, which first started going digital in 2002. And, you know, by now, just about every major studio film is digital, at least at the effects point. So there is some digital native content that we're currently um, kind of just treating in, in a, a way that is kind of cheating, and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so suddenly, at some point at Eastman House, we needed to start managing born digital works. Um, for Eastman House, it first manifested as a Lucas Samaras piece called Photo Facts and Photo Fictions, which was kind of this weird new media art piece, but the museum acquired it to kind of prepare for the, the oncoming digital tide. Um, so this is the, the cheating I was referring to earlier in that um, one way to handle born digital material is to handle it as an object derivative. So let's not acquire the digital file that made this Jonathan Lewis print the pixels, which by the way, uh, the pixels is a really cool portfolio of pixelated Beatle, Beatles album covers and my notes do not specify which one this is, but I think... I don't think it's Abbey Road like everyone always thinks it is. I think this is the one that tricks you. But uh, next time I'm in Rochester, I'll, I'll make sure to look it up. Um, so museums and, and Eastman House in general started adopting this attitude, and it was kind of a good first step. But it became obvious pretty quick that managing digital assets was going to become a core competency for the museum side of the house. Um, and kind of like web and mobile's doing now, uh, many institutions decided that rather than outsource it, they would make it an internal base of knowledge so that the museum could handle it themselves. And especially when you started relating digital storage to collection storage, the museum became way keener with the idea of not outsourcing that. So while this digital shift in production was happening, the process behind digitizing analog objects got a whole lot better. It's at the point today where we can more or less capture all the information present in a 35 millimeter negative with the right scanning rig. And of course, uh, you know, not to get too pedantic, but 
by all, I mean almost all of the useful, and by useful, I mean resolvable with the eye. Uh, there's a whole lot of information that uh, the eye can't resolve that still may be there, and that's grain or subgrain information. Um, but generally, by all, I mean we can capture at the grain level, whereas adding more resolution just gives us better detailed grain, not necessarily better detailed overall images. And by 35 millimeters, I'm not counting anything super exotic, like technical pan, which can have an ISO of 1, which is insane. I don't even want to know how that works. Or the holographic film, which I also don't want to know how it works. I'm a technologist, but only to the extent that I want to know how sane technology works, not holographic film. That sounds insane. So, secrets, or, or things I needed to learn about digital before digital became manageable for me, is a good way of putting it. But it, I added an image to illustrate secrets, so I went with that. It's all about the punters, and by that, of course, I mean it in the way you guys mean it, uh, which is users or, or kind of uh, consumers of a digital archive. This is an image of Sav Raka, who is a former Australian rules football player who played many seasons for the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, this joke got one or two laughs in Wellington, three or four the first time I made it at the powerhouse, but it killed in Melbourne. Um, because I guess Savrock actually played in Melbourne for a long time, and for some reason uh, Melbourne seemed to be pretty nuts for the, the football. Uh, I don't know why. I much preferred rugby. I thought it was a much better sport uh, to, to watch on TV at least, but maybe that's because I know more of the rules. Uh, so we've got a formal way of kind of making it all about the punters, and that's this OACE model which is a conceptual reference model for a kind of any modern archival system, but it's particularly applied to digital systems. It's kind of a mashup of the IT iterative methodology and digital preservation. It was developed by those guys that own space, uh, NASA, and the, I know NASA, it's, it's kind of weird. Like, what do they have to do with cultural heritage? As it turns out, nothing, but they do have to manage an awful lot of digital data. So they kind of lended us a hand. Um, and it defines digital preservation or the act of fulfilling uh, or, or successful digital preservation as that which kind of fulfills the requirements of people from the future, which is a bit weird, but it is kind of what we're all going for. Um, the other big thing about digital preservation is in the States, we've got this ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I don't know if you've got that in lands where you use the, the metric system, but I've converted it for you. Um, I mean, don't actually use those measurements if you're like trying to calculate whether or not, you know, the bungee jump, the bungee cord will hold or, or kind of anything important. But uh, roughly speaking, uh, a little bit of prevention is worth an awful lot of cure. And with digital, that is just so entirely true. Uh, a couple thousand dollars invested into a digital asset management system saves you from having to pay someone for a six month project to comb through a photographer's hard drive and pull out all the useful stuff. Um, planning is the best friend of digital preservation. Um, we should always be preservation minded when we think digitally and that's kind of through the whole stack, through the actual process of digitizing collection material, any processing that happens to those images and the way we disseminate those images. We should always be thinking with kind of a mindset of preservation. Um, and with that comes an understanding of the limitations of outsourcing. It's really tempting to use some of the amazing services provided by Google or Amazon to kind of insist with digital preservation. Um, but ultimately, those systems break down if you don't have a physical copy on site. And, you know, it's digital, so physical is a little, you know, you, we, could, we could argue that. We could argue if it's a physical copy or not. But you should have some sort of digital storage in-house that's got that material on it so that you don't have to deal with for example, what happened with the whole mega upload thing and the government just seizing it and going like, you'll get it back when we want to give it back to you. Like that doesn't fly for information that needs to be persisted forever, like museum collections. So digital preservation really comes down to teamwork. And as this, my favorite image in the Eastman House collection illustrates, uh, sometimes a baby monkey needs to team up with a baby rhinoceros. Um, and so, you know, really the whole reason why digital preservation is even a problem is that we've got adversarial relationships between these team members. And of course, those team members are 
uh, your end users, curators, archivists, librarians, and your IT folks. I mean, I think about 90% of the problem with digital preservation is that most institutions have an adversarial relationship with their technology folks. And it's a shame. It doesn't have to be that way. They're not, uh, you know, they, they can get along quite well if you uh, kind of approach it correctly. So the consumers in this team provide the targets. They provide the goals, what, what, what we're doing, why we're doing it, what success is. Um, there's talk of context. So you've got intellectual context, which for a new, let's just say a newspaper archive, right? The intellectual context of a newspaper is its content. The object context of a newspaper is its layout, its format, its, its the paper it's printed on, the smell of the ink, the fact that the ink never dries. Uh, which is a result of the cheap printing process, but uh, I won't let myself get too distracted by that as uh, it is oh, 16 minutes, so I've got I've to hurry. Um, but, you know, your consumers are going to define an awful lot of your expectations for later output. And from there, it's really kind of working backwards from those expectations to figure out what you need to get at the outset to fulfill those expectations. Uh, curators, of course, provide for museums the most important part, or one of the most important parts, the kind of unique selling uh, proposition of the museum is contextual interpretation, and that's exactly why curators exist. I mean, yes, in the large form they exist to care for the collection, but uh, their funny way of collecting or caring for collections seems to be interpreting them, which I actually kind of really like. And so pretty much whenever you go to a digital conference related to museums, somebody throws up a slide that says content is king. And in fact, uh, there were more than one content is king slides at uh, the National Digital Forum, if, I, if I'm remembering correctly. So I, I counter with this slide, uh, which is funny because that's Queen the band. Uh, and if you didn't know that, um, that's exactly why curators are important, um, because they... They let you know that I was talking about the band, not necessarily the the monarch position, or, or but you know it's neither here nor there. I've I've done about twenty takes, so I'm not going to redo this to to explain that joke better. So you can ask a question about it later if you want. Um, so this is my most contentious slide, and that's that archivists and librarians provide acronyms. They, of course, provide much more than that, but if I wanted to be cynical, which I did when I made this slide originally, I would point out that uh, of Lido, OAI, PMH, MARC, EAD, XML, WTF, um, you know, I don't think a single one of those has ever practically solved a problem that a museum has uh, with respect to, to sharing data, at least not a small museum. They solve plenty of problems for places like the Metropolitan, the Smithsonian, the Getty, uh, the powerhouse museum, you know, institutions of, of world renown, uh, kind of expertise and size. Um, but for small institutions like the Toothpick Museum or the Jello Museum, um, you know, those standards get out of whack. But you need somebody that's got that domain expertise on hand to, to kind of make sure that your metadata storage and that your metadata standards are up to snuff with the field. And the other interesting reason to include archivists in digital preservation projects is that many of the problems one run is, runs into with digital preservation are actually archive management issues in disguise, and archivists are great at solving those. IT provides infrastructure, and that's the kind of day-to-day -day migration, emulation, and abstraction work that one needs uh, to kind of have a successful archival system. Um, and so since they're so good at persisting data because it's part of what an IT person's responsibility is, uh, it's foolish to not lean on them as a central pillar of action in a digital archival system. Uh, many institutions don't have IT folks or have IT folks that are kind of not up to corporate snuff and that they're IT folks because they were good at computers 10 years ago and they worked a lot cheaper than hiring an IT person. So you've got to be really careful about bad advice. but. On the whole, IT people provide vital functions for digital preservation that you shouldn't try and work around because uh, it's part of their day-to-day -day life, doing many of the things that, that will be your goals in digital preservation. And so again, circling back to this idea of ignoring digital preservation at your peril, um, the fact remains that if you're collecting, an actively collecting institution, 
uh, you'll have to deal with Born Digital Works at some point. Uh, the New Media Consortium's 2011 Horizon Report puts it in the four to five year timetable, and we're already about a year out from that, so it's really a three to four year timetable. And starting early means less costly error, errors, and it means that you become competent a lot quicker. So if you leave yourself some wiggle room to have some minor setbacks, uh, you can do a lot to uh, kind of get up to speed faster. And it appears that my 20 minutes is roughly up. So thank you all for listening to me ramble on. I will not attempt to listen to this before I send it, as I don't like the sound of my own voice recorded. I don't think anyone does. So if there are any problems or anything that's not perfectly clear, you will have an opportunity to ask me questions via Skype, as long as the internet works. And the internet works a lot. So I'm hopeful that I will actually be able to entertain your questions. Thanks. Bye. I mean, not really bye, because you'll see me in a minute on Skype. But yeah, this is the awkward part of recording it. It's like, do I hand it off now? I think I'm just going to end it.